A people like ours should be free to make its own failures and successes. Free to gain that political wisdom and political experience which come only from the practice of political affairs. Otherwise, led as we are by a string, we remain without credit abroad and with no self-respect at home. A bastard, feckless conglomeration of individuals inspired by no common purpose, moving to no common end. Yeah? And I was recently reading something from Sunditi Maharaj and she describes one of the fundamental dilemmas is that sense of common purpose. And I keep saying to my partner in fixing TNT, Kirk, there are many Trinidad and Tobago's. They'll get tied up. Yeah? And I don't think we understand that. So, tonight, let us begin the session, Boom Up History, and welcome Afro Raymond to the stage, Bussin Files. Give thanks. This season of reflection is something I started doing a few years ago in terms of trying to explore our space and what is happening in our space. And I look at these significant holidays, and there were three significant holidays in the middle of our year. And the three holidays fall in a particular pattern, and I follow a deeper pattern of writing and thinking in that period. The first holiday is on the 1st of August, which of course is Emancipation Day, which marked the end of slavery within the British West Indies, the Atlantic slave trade and so on. And the second day is the 31st of August, which is independence, which marks our moving away from colonialism to become an independent country. And of course, the 24th of September is Republic Day, which is our moving away from the Queen as head of state and having our own state. And republicanism implies, beyond independence, it implies a sort of an, a degree to which everybody is equal. So we no longer have lords and earls and dukes and princesses. We're all equal. So it's really important for me every year for those two months, which is the month of August and the month of September, to have these deeper interrogations. Wendell will know, we tried to have this talk before, about two or three weeks back and forth, and it finally ended up on the 11th of October. But the talk was supposed to be within the season of reflection. It didn't work that way. And during this season, I try to explore themes like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What, what do we know? And there are parts that will get a bit metaphysical, because this, this evening, what I'm feeling in terms of what I feel to speak about, I'm not going to stay with the usual thing. So the usual thing is where I will get into something legalistic or financial. And I will talk about the legalistic and financial implications and so on and so on. And I'm going to go a little bit inside. So the theme, the title is, is Bussing Files, but I'm going to bust some internal files. Like a season of reflection. So one of the internal files is to, is to do with the space where we are now and what we're doing. Because I think that at moments like this, in our history, it's really important the work that artists do. It's really important the work that artists and cultural people do. And in fact, in a kind of a way, they have to work closely for, for the best result. They have to work closely with people who do the other kind of thing like what I do. That's really important. So I salute Tree Canal, because Tree Canal is a leading group in this type of work, consciousness and so on. And this space is a leading space within Port of Spain to get that, that stuff going. The example I will give, let me step out and give a little example to back up what I'm saying. We have a, a propensity here in Trinidad and Tobago, and in Caribbean generally, but Trinidad and Tobago has it very, very bad to rely on laws. So one of the big problems in the country is corruption, so we rely on laws. And I can tell you where corruption is concerned, Trinidad and Tobago has a lot of laws. We have an Integrity in Public Life Act. We have a Freedom of Information Act. We have a Public Procurement and Disposal of Property Act about to become fully implemented. We have a Prevention of Corruption Act. We have a Proceeds of Crime Act. And I could go on and on. There's 10, 12 important laws that are well written and that fit in with all kinds of international standards. And we don't seem to be able to get it, to be able to actually hold people and lock them up and make them pay. We know the corruption is getting worse and worse, but we don't seem to be able to hold people. And part of it is to do with the imagination, because it might seem like I'm talking about a practical thing. So bridges to be built from here to there, and $10 million was stolen 
but the police didn't do their job. So, it's a practical thing I'm talking about, right? Because the policeman took some money, but it's not a practical thing. Because the people in the police, the people in the court, the people don't actually believe that's a crime. When they're talking about crime, they're not talking about that. They believe crime is something else. Crime is the person who tried to come in your sister's yard last night to thief the mangoes. That's crime. They don't believe it's crime. And what I want to say is that there's some really interesting examples of cultural work to intervene in practical problems coming out of Australia. I know Robert and Leslie are here. I see Dawn is here. So we're talking about filmmaking. And if you go onto YouTube and you look at some of these channels from Australia concerning practical issues, so an issue like don't drink and drive, or an issue like you must wear your seatbelt, or you shouldn't smoke while you're pregnant, a practical public health issue, a practical public safety issue, they have made some films out there. I have never seen films with that high impact. The acting, the scripting, the photography, the lighting. They use computer models to tell you that if the motorcycle had been going at this speed, he would have been able to stop. And they actually lay out the whole thing. When you see one of those movies for 60 seconds, it will change your whole perspective on the question that they're exploring. So in Australia, <clears throat> at some level, in terms of public awareness and making progress, they have made an advance because they use the efforts of their cultural workers to produce these high impact products that are on TV and so before the news and so on. It's really, you must check it out. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it. It's really, really an amazing quality of work. The other thing I wanted to talk about was really the question of what are we about in terms of information and knowledge? Because I've had a conviction for some time that we're about an information revolution, an information age, in which everybody has one of these things, like a smartphone. And you can turn on your smartphone and look up anything right now. So if I say something, you could look it up and eight seconds later, you could know I got the date wrong, or I got the figure wrong. It's like that out here now, okay? But is it? So we have an information revolution that isn't an information revolution. Is that me? Am I getting a call? No, your phone, sorry. No, not my phone, right? sorry. Anyway, you have an information revolution out here where, in fact, we think there's an information revolution because we have the smartphones, because you can go on Google and look for anything, yeah? And because you have Facebook, which everybody's talking to everybody all the time, all now, back and forth, back and forth. People wanted this to be on Facebook Live and thing. But I'm not doing that. But in fact, the main information about the country, our country, is suppressed. The main information about the country is suppressed. So we have a country in which one of the biggest use, as far as I'm concerned, coming out of the profession I come from, which is surveying, I'm a surveyor, I'm into the property, real estate, and construction industry. One of the biggest issues for me, if I have to name one four-letter word, is land. Land is a huge issue. We have a land policy that's 25 years old. 11th of November, 1992. And that land policy is still in effect. It hasn't been revoked, it hasn't been reversed, it hasn't been revised. It's disappeared. It's not on any official website. If you call the Ministry of Agriculture and ask for it, they will tell you to call town and country planning. If you call town and country planning, they will tell you, well, no, 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 no. That is the regional corporation. The actual national land policy, this is like something in sci-fi, has been made to disappear. So the politicians are still dealing in land, with land for landless and all the different schemes and plans and so on. Now they're selling land to the people with the certificate of comfort, all kinds of schemes. But the actual policy that's supposed to guide the actions of the officials has been made to disappear. But not completely, it's available at my website, so. <laughs> but, but officially, it's not there. Same thing with housing. We have a housing policy. 22nd of September 2002, 15 years old. Senator Danny Montana was the housing minister at the time. He had launched a new housing policy. That was the one that was supposed to have 100,000 houses, 100,000 new homes in 10 years. Really ambitious. 
And with the passage of time, and it didn't take too long, Trinidad, some things happened very quickly, it became inconvenient. And that too disappeared. So if you go to the HDC, you have a newfangled minister of housing, I'll say his name, I hope you're listening to this, Randall Mitchell, attorney at law. You have a new minister of housing who launched a new website about six weeks ago on which everything about housing could be found. Policy and application forms and maps about where the houses are and everything. The one thing that's not on the website is the housing policy. Well, you know where you could find it, eh? AfroRaymond.net. <laughs> you can't find it. <laughs> you can't find it in the official place because it's been made to disappear. So that is the foolishness we're dealing with. And I'm using the word foolishness deliberately, not in an attempt to be offensive, but to juxtapose it with the notion that we are educated. So we have 60 years of public education. We're supposedly an educated country. We're supposed to be doing better every year than we did the year before. And at the highest level, and I mean the highest level, up to, up to um, President Honorable Kamona, at the highest level, we are dealing with this practice of concealment. Is my friend here? Where is she? Where is she? Right, yes, yes, the lady in blonde, yeah, Rhoda, yeah. <laughs> you see, we're dealing with this concealment. So we have a real issue as far as information is concerned and how we treat with information. How much do we really want to know? And when do we want to know it? Going back to the American thing in those crime series, what did you know and when did you know it? It's a serious thing, what did we know? We don't even know what the policies are in the country. Now, the other thing I want to say now, so we talked about the whole information schism, where things disappear, commissions of inquiry, reports disappear. So we have um, the off commission of inquiry, Patrick Manning was under a tremendous amount of pressure. That was the one to do it, um, pu the public construction sector. It was published in April 2010, and I could give you the background story, no names, but the report was completed, and it was submitted to cabinet. And the talk that came out, it didn't come out, it came to a small circle of us, was that it was being doctored. It was being doctored. So they have people in the country who are skilled to doctor things, eh? To make a fish end up looking like an egg and all kind of thing, eh? So they were doctoring the report to take out certain parts and so on. But we got to hear. And went and said, listen, we have the report. Don't ask us how we got it, we have it. And if you doctor it, we will embarrass you all. That's how that report got published. And that's probably the first time a commission of inquiry report got published in a timely fashion in this country. But here the joke, thank you. But here the joke, it got published, but the actual proceedings of the commission of inquiry, what proceedings are is this? Proceedings are if Franca is giving testimony on day number 32, and she's talking about the bridge down by her, and how the workmen never used to fasten the bolts, and she gives all of her testimony. That particular piece of testimony may not make its way into the report. The report will contain broad things and conclusions and so. That testimony is on affidavit. She was cross-examined as evidence. All of that is on the website as proceedings. And they're really important. Huh? I'm going to talk about why they're important in relation to education and information just now. All of the off-inquiry proceedings have been made to vanish. So here the irony. The Patrick Manning administration was, was squeezed by a particular set of things to publish it in April of 2010. Six weeks later, they were gone. As they would say, gone. They were gone. Kamala won the election. That's public, um, the People's Partnership. And I don't know what caused it, but six months later, the website that contained all the off proceedings, just in, in, in internet language, Novak, it just went dark. So you got a big error message. And I tried. At that time, I was JCC president. I tried to get various people to reinstate the website. I mean, why would, why would the People's Partnership want to cut off a website that had all this embarrassing information on the PNM? Because that's what had driven Manning from office. I mean, I talked to Prakash Ramada, I remember Anand Ramloga, and I remember Herbert Voldy, I remember Chris Lidmore. And basically, it was one of those things that can't happen. Nobody could restore it. Every, they were lying up and down the place. And it ended up that up to now, 
quotation marks, officially, because some of us have copies. <laughs> officially, <laughs> officially, they made every effort to force the of proceedings off the public record. So we have a very sick relationship with the truth. It's sick at the highest level. Eh? I'm not talking about the man in the street or the man selling orange. I'm talking about the highest level. They are sick. They don't want the truth. They're hostile to the truth. Okay? The relationship between information and education is important. Because we're trying to develop an educated society. And for generations, we have believed that education is the way out. And education is the way to improvement of the society and to the family and the individual and all of that kind of thing, okay? Myself, all, mostly everybody here, I'm sure. But in fact, what is this education? What is it we really studying? Because when you finish a basic degree, because a basic degree, like a first degree, you would do like textbooks, whether it's economics or Spanish or whatever, you do like a basic course and get your bachelor's degree. When you go to postgraduate level, you're supposed to engage in something called research. Research and interrogation. So you're either doing research or you're interrogating existing research and it's a kind of level of, of engagement that's deeper. But what is Trinidad and Tobago really engaging in? So we have a situation where the Commission of Inquiry report into the Piaco fiasco, which is called the Bernard Report, has been suppressed. That's, tell them I'm busy, I'm not, no. That's not me, yeah. Yeah, the Commission on Inquiry report into the, Piaco, into the Piaco fiasco has been suppressed for like 13 or 14 years now. It came out in 2003. The Commission of Inquiry report into the, of inquiry into public sector construction was published because of pressure but the proceedings were suppressed. So the people at UTT and UE studying things on UTEC and studying things like architecture and engineering and what do you call it? Construction management and project management. What do they study? Have we, did we do anything here? Have we learned anything here? Well, we sure did. But our leaders don't want it to come out. Because I could tell you, having read those reports, yes, I read both of them. Having read those reports, there's a lot to learn about what happened, and why it happened, and why it went wrong, and so on, and so on. And one of the characteristics, it's very interesting, one of the characteristics of a people <coughs> who are committed to education, no matter how ignorant they are, is that certain records are always preserved. So when we talk about the slave trade, let's talk about it, let's, let's get expansive. When you talk about the slave trade, you could actually trace back that this particular boat went to this port in Africa on this date and picked up a cargo of so many men, so many women, so many children. In some cases, they get descriptions of the people. We, they crossed the sea. Who died? They got to somewhere in, in the New World, whether it's America or Latin America or the Caribbean or South America. They were sold in, into bondage, into slavery, and so on. And you could actually trace those records the same thing with the Nazis, World War II, 1939 to 1945. Millions of Europeans killed. Europeans killed Europeans. And they kept all the records. So they could tell you, when well, we were going up the street and we held on to Emily. And she was a 19-year-old Jewess. And she seemed to be somebody who played the violin because she was fighting to keep her violin, but we smashed it. And we have all of those records are there. What it is that Trinidad and Tobago is involved in that our records have been destroyed or hidden? You understand? Even, even people who are, who are on the other side, at least you might think so, morally, kept all the records. We are unable to keep the files. We in so much schemes. We just train away files out the back door. Like every 30 days we train away, scheme, train away files. It's really serious. And I remember making a case to Ram Logan, Ramada, Chris Moore, Volney, all of those people, that these documents the of inquiry proceedings are important documents for national learning. They need to be rescued. 
They need to be placed in a national institute of reference. And I, 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 I had actually broke out a deal with Nalis for Nalis to do it. But there were some difficulties with UE and UTT and so. And in, fa in fact, if you think about the areas that the off inquiry covered, it covered government, it covered political science, it covered management, it covered engineering, it covered architecture, it covered surveying, it covered economics, it covered finance. But our head is so hard, and we don't want to learn. We rather throw away everything you see. It's a serious thing, you know. So this, this is a serious thing, and I want to talk a little bit about the internal side of it. Because many times, up to now, I've been speaking about the external side of it. And, and what happened to these documents, and efforts that I might have made, and colleagues, and so on, and so on. But let's talk about the internal side. And, and to make the point that the sort of, and I'm, I'm speaking to the younger people, some of whom aren't here, but who will be looking on later at the recordings. The, the thing about this kind of work is that you have a situation where you have to really confront yourself. Eh? If you're going to take on what it is I'm doing, you have to confront yourself. And if you don't confront yourself and win, you're not going to be able to do it. You will think you could do it, but you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to do it. And by that I mean that the, the, when, I, when I meet somebody who is taking on this kind of thing, I always ask them what have they been involved in and what have they done and so on. Because there's corruption all around us. Eh? It's in families. If you're in a company, it's probably, it's probably there's parts of it in the company. If you're in a profession, or, or, or a kind of a fraternity, it's, it's probably, there's something there, you know. In a neighborhood, it's certainly there. <coughs> Pardon me. And the golden test is not really to be able to recognize corruption. Because this is a nation of finger pointers. So we could always say, you ting, 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 and you ting, ting, ting. We could do that. That's, that's a national sport. The real question is, are you going to be able to recognize corruption in your own circle? Are you going to be able to recognize corruption with somebody who sits at your dining table? With somebody who sleeps in the same bed with you? Who eats from the same pot with you? Who belongs to the same fraternity? Who's a partner in the same firm? Someone who effectively is one of you. Spotting corruption is not so hard when it's those awful people from the other race, whatever that is, who live across the street or down the way. It's really, really difficult when it's in your own house. And it's people looking like you, eating from the same pot, sleeping in the same bed. And if you're not able to do that, and it is an exercise, eh? I'm using the word exercise purposely. If you're not able to do that, you're not going to be able to build the moral fiber to deal with this issue. You're going to wallow, and you're going to wonder why you're not getting through, and what it is going wrong. Let me look at the camera for the young people, because eh? this audience is not too young. You're going to wallow, and you're going to wonder... Why it is what you're doing is not working. Because you're not really engaging with yourself. And you have to engage with yourself to win. <coughs> Sorry. So, I want to talk a little bit about some of the particular things. I'm good. I'm coming over to get a sip of Guinness. But yeah, I want to talk a little bit about some of the particular things and to speak a little bit about where we are. I'll talk about CL Financial. Um, there were some other things, but let's talk about CL Financial for a second. Because what we have at CL Financial is a real colossal kind of civilizational crisis. Huh? It's not just a financial failure. It's the biggest financial crisis in a century. But it's not just a financial failure. It's actually a civilizational failure. So we had this group of people, and let us say it, Black people, people of African descent, people of color. Let us say what it is. It wasn't Indian. There hasn't been an Indian conglomerate. So when they talk about Indian, what is it? Business genius and financial acumen. There hasn't been an Indian conglomerate that took over the Caribbean. There hasn't been. Dupree was the man. I'm talking about Cyril. It was a Caribbean connection. So Cyril Dupree had a connection with his compadre, Cyril Montano. Monsanto, there were two Cyrils. Cyril Monsanto was a Lucian. He was from St. Lucia. 
When Dupree started Clico in 1936, he was 37 years old. He would look at me like an old man. He was 37 years old when he started the thing. He had lived in America for 19 years. And he decided to come here and try to do something back in his homeland. And at that time, the financial sector, because that time was colonial times, eh? we were 25 years away from independence. At that point, the colonial powers, Barclays Bank and Royal Bank and all these kind of people, they were the ones who ran the financial world, the insurance companies and the, and the banks were run by white people from the first world. And the notion of a black man or a group of black men, young black men, opening a finance company that traded in insurance was something that was viewed as a kind of insanity. Yeah? And the kind of individual he was, it's very interesting because there's a, there's a certain kind of thing that, that we talk about in terms of naming. And when you give something a particular name, you try to imbue it with a particular meaning. And of course, he named the company Colonial Life. And I, I, I have always had my own theory about that. I know we have a Q&A later, so we could, um, we could exchange on it. But at that point in time, I mean, no, colonial is a bad word. So if you're, in, if you're in liberal circles and you're arguing with somebody, you could tell them, well, I find your attitude is too colonial. And it's almost like a kind of a curse. Back then, the word colonial, from what I've been able to read, I wasn't alive. From what I've been able to read, the word colonial really referred to, it was a code word for black and Indian people. So when in the 30s and the 40s, there was a thing about colonial people coming to England. They weren't complaining about the Australians and the New Zealanders and the Canadians. They were complaining about the other people. They want to look like us. So when Mr. Dupree decided in 1936 to name his company Colonial Life Insurance Company, it was real defiant. It was like if me and Rubidi, we decided to form a finance company together with Novak. <laughs> and <laughs> together with Novak. And we were to call the finance company the Nubian Savings Institution. It's, it was blatant at that time to call the company Colonial Life. He did it. And they had other problems, some of, some of the reading I've done. And I want to come, I'm coming back to Dupree just now, later on in the narrative about, about censorship and about information and about education. Huh? But let's just stay with the development of Clico. And one of the interesting things is that the salesmen had a hard time. I think they were at Queen Street, 75 Queen Street or something. The salesmen had a hard time. People used to slam the door in their face and give them a hard time. People used to run them. What a black man doing selling insurance? That's white people business. That was, they were told that to their face, you know? And Dupree Cyril, very inspirationally said to his salesman, that, you know, he said, I understand all that. He said, I understand all that. And in fact, the Creole man, which is a code word at the time in this place for people of color, the Creole man doesn't support the Creole man in business. But I believe that if you give a man service and you give a man value, he would return to you. And I intend to give both. And of course, the rest is history. Because here we are, there's a huge conglomerate and so on. The, the people did a lot of good work, and they built up the company and so on. The company had branches throughout the Caribbean. They had branches in Belize, Guyana. The only place they didn't have branches was Jamaica, but that's another story. Um, Barbados, the Eastern Caribbean, um, the Bahamas. They really built up themselves very well. And at some point about 30 years ago, Cyril's younger relative, Lawrence, he's not his nephew, his second cousin, took control of the business and they formed the CL Financial. And that is how we started to get the company expanding into different things. So the company started expanding into real estate because they bought out home construction. They started expanding into energy. They created this methanol holdings. They expanded into liquor. They bought out Angostura and they bought other liquor companies internationally. And of course, this expansion grew and grew. They bought Republic Bank and so on. The expansion grew and grew. And the entire model, this is what's really interesting, yeah? and it's humbling. So at one level, if you wanted to take that kind of stance, you could be really proud of the fact that a black family did this and people of African descent. But at another level, what was actually taking place inside? Internal architecture, the thing 
with so much confusion that he just couldn't survive it. Because what was happening, they were borrowing money. Because when you, when, you, when you take out a product, when you borrow, when you put money with them on an EFPA, you in fact are lending them your money at 11% or 12%. They were borrowing money at a very high interest rate, short term, to make long term investments. Now that's a recipe for a crash. It's not a Ponzi scheme. Some people have used the word Ponzi scheme. It's not a Ponzi scheme. It's not a pyramid. But as sure as hell, you have to keep it going. Otherwise, you will face plant. And that's what happened to them. So the marketing was designed to say, we are financial masters. We can handle your money for you. We know what to do. We could get you 11%. Scotiabank only paying 3%. And it worked. They were persuasive, they had good suits, everybody knew the Clico salesmen, they were people who were... No, they were people who were wrong, everybody knew them, you know what I mean? And they, they, they picked a nice cross-section of salesmen and saleswomen and so on. So the, the, the formula worked for them. But in terms of what they were actually, actually doing, stupidness, real stupidness. And, and stupidness could work for a while, all of us are old enough to know that. You could do stupidness for a little while and get through with it. But after a while, reality will will intervene. And then, and then you have to kind of come back to earth. What happened is that Dupree was able, and Monty were able, with the kind of, I would have, I would, some people call it political donations, I call it premium. The kind of premiums that they paid in political contributions. Because Dupree paid his money to UNC. And uh, of course Monty was the PNM treasurer. So it, he was, Steve Clico was reputed to be the biggest financier of, of p and And when they got to the crisis, they were able to step into the Minister of Finance's office and cut a deal inside of 17 days to have the company bailed out. And the company was really bailed out on excellent terms because they were able to keep all their shares they were able to get as much money as they want because there was no limit set on it. There was no limit to say, well, you're getting this much and no more. They were able to get as much as they want and they only paid interest on the first five billion, 4.75% interest, which was half of the average interest at that time, less than half. And uh, they could pay back whenever they like. So there was no term for repayment. So if you look at the whole amount of money they borrowed, about 25 billion, you only paid 4.75% interest on the first five. And there's something in finance we call the average weighted cost of capital, which you work out. And the average weighted cost of that capital is less than 1%. It's something like 0.8 or 0.7%. It's less than 1%. And in fact, nobody gets money to borrow at, point at less than 1% unless you've made handsome contributions over the years. And that's why I call it a premium, because it's a special insurance policy. <laughs> you understand? So you didn't understand insurance. We have borne the burden of that the whole time. Because what has happened is that the thing has ballooned from an estimated five billion. The first time that it was told to the public, they told us it was going to be five billion dollars. Now I know a couple of people who were in that cabinet and they said to me that they knew it was 10. To tell any kind of games, the mind games that go on. They knew it was 10, but 10 wouldn't fly. So they were told to say five. And then later on to say, well, you know, this thing has changed and the figures have changed and so. So they knew it was going to be about 10. And what has happened throughout this bailout has been a real crime of the century. Yeah? So we started off with $5 billion, we were told, in January of 2009. Later in 2009, we were told it's actually 10. Mrs. Prasad Besessa and her team win the election in May of 2010. And Mr. Dukaran reads the budget on September the 8th of 2010. And it's an epic budget. Eh? You know, we have to recognize certain moments. Eh? And there was a three-week period. You know, people talk about Kennedy and they talk about Camelot. There was a three-week period between September the 8th, 2010, 2010 and the 1st of October, 2010. When the People's Partnership recognized and tried to grapple with the financial monsters. They were overwhelmed, eh? as, we, as we now know. <laughs> but they tried to grapple with it. And Mr. Dukaran recognized it when he read the budget. 
he was basically saying, look at this huge amount of money we've paid out. We can't continue to pay it out. This is crazy. This is taking out all the money in the country to do this one, this one contract. I mean, to change it, and that's when he made his suggestion. If you have $300,000 to get, hear what? We're giving you $75,000, and you have to wait 20 years for the rest. That's why Dukaran did that. I'm not a people's partnership closet supporter or anything. I was very disappointed, but you got to say what it is. It was an attempt to grapple with it. Mrs. Passat Bessessa came along on the 1st of October 2010 and gave a really fine speech. And that was the one where she announced the commission of inquiry and so on. And on that occasion, some really important points were made. Kamala was saying, listen, you all came to the parliament, by you all she was talking to the PNM, the other side. She said, you all came to the parliament in January last year and said you wanted to do this bailout. You wanted to borrow five because it was affecting the stability of the whole country. And we supported you all. Here we are now. We can see that 7.3 has been spent. $7.3 billion has been spent. We are trying to step, and step on the brakes and create this $75,000 20-year option. You are now screaming at us about old people, poor people, your granny, the pensioners, the trade unions, the credit unions. So who got that $7.3 billion? Kamala's speech is utterly brilliant. Who got it? If the pretext of the first thing was to pay off these people to keep the economy stable, and you paid out more, 50% more than you said you needed, who got the money? She went further, and she said, because you see, as I told you, they were trying to contend with the financial forces, and they got, over, they got overpowered. Eh? She went further, and she said, we need to borrow another $7 billion to pay off everything. So the total would have been $14.3 billion back in 1st of October 2010. This year, Mr. Imbert given a speech on the 10th of um, May this year. The speech was called the Mid-Year Budget Review. And in that speech, Imbert is telling the Parliament, it's a prepared speech, is printed as the Ministry of Web, Finance website, he's telling the Parliament that he estimates the amount of money spent in the bailout is $27.7 billion. The question is, where did all that money go? Sorry, just um. Where did all that money go? How could we go from a position that in October 2010 you were telling me that you need $14.3 billion to settle everybody? The point where, and I'm just using you metaphorically because the Minister of Finance is an institution. The Minister of Finance is an office. It's not about Kamla or Dukaran or Imbert or anybody. It's an office in this country. How could you be going from a position where you're telling me on the 1st of October 2010 you need 14.3 billion to a position where with a straight, straight face you're watching me on the 10th of May of 2017 telling me that you spent 27.7 billion. And still, Mr. Peter Permel has a group with 15,000 people who haven't been paid. You understand the bacchanal? Ramesh representing a group, they went to the Privy Council four months ago, they get licks in the case. That's the next 7,000 people who didn't get paid. Well, you understand the bacchanal? So when David Rudder sang that song, Panama, <laughs> and he said, the thief, the money, the thief, the money, the thief, the money. And that is the reason that I did my litigation. Because I sued the state, the Minister of Finance, to get information, and not just broad information, I want details about where that money went. I want details about who got the money. Don't come about, if you got money, I want your name, and I want the date you got the money. I'm not, I'm not joking, I'm very serious. And my lawsuit is not a lawsuit for money. All the other lawsuits you hear about with Clico are for money. So when Mr. Permanent Court, they were trying to collect this money, that money, and that money. When Ramesh went to England, he was trying to collect this money, this money, this money, and this interest. I'm not trying to collect any money. I want information. This is about information. This is about education. This is about developing a nation. We cannot get where we are. This is what this is about. I had some little money. There's no big thing. My money was $274,000. Raymond and I had some pension. I get to find out about them. About 04, I get to make them out. About 03 or 04, yes, you answer so many policy. I see you smiling. 
we had some policies with Clico, including a pension. It was not a fancy EFPA thing. It was a normal pension. You know, the only one where you pay the same amount every month. And you wait 25 years. And when you get old and thing, you start to collect a check. It's one of those real standard pensions. That's what we had. And I got to make them out about 2003 or 2004. There were some schemes. And we had to shut it down. So my money was kind of locked in a place. And when all of this went down, I called for it. And I got something I might have gotten. 75000 or 65000 And I get $1,200 a month until I drop down. So that's my, that's my payback from the thing. But I wasn't one of the high interest, 12% and 11%. We weren't in that, in that class at all. The point is that some kind of serious crime has taken place. Eh? I'm very, very serious. Eh? So we have a situation in this country. We talk about economic and social justice. We have a situation in this country where, in fact, we don't have enough soap in the hospitals. We don't have enough toilet paper in the hospitals. But we had enough money to sign a binding piece of paper to bail out the richest man in the Caribbean, interest-free, as much money as he want. As the Calypso money is king says, growling tiger. There was a line in the Calypso that's classic in the first verse. He said, you could pay the bill whenever you like. That's, that's what it means to be king when money is king. You could pay the bill whenever you like. We'll send the goods by you on a bike. Yeah, that's the Calypso from 37. Now, the point is that we're looking at a situation where all of this money has been spent. And I have been trying to get three things. I've been trying to get, firstly, the audited accounts for the group. Because that would disclose a lot of the related party transactions and the transactions between the companies. If it is they don't have audited accounts for the group, I asked for whatever the respective Minister of Finance was relying on. Because when you study it, from Karen Nunes to Shera, to Winston Dukaran, to Larry Hawaii, to the current incumbent, Mr. Imbert, all of our ministers of finance get up and give speeches about Clico and they call figures. Well, my, what, my, what my application to the court was, either you give me the audited accounts, or whatever he's drinking, I want one of those. Because the minister can't be making up figures. All of these ministers, they've given dozens of speeches and sworn affidavits and gone to court and so on. Where are they getting those figures from? I wanted rat. The high court granted me that, 22nd of July, 2015. Second thing I wanted, second thing I wanted was, in fact, a special briefing that they held. Because in September 2011, there was a special briefing that they held for the independent senators. They were trying to pass two laws to push the bailout forward. And... This is the People's Partnership. They knew that they had their own votes. They knew that the PNM had backed up the whole thing in the first place. So they had those votes. The only votes that were in doubt, although the PNM ultimately gave a little trouble, but the only votes that were in doubt were the independent senators. Therefore, a special briefing was convened. The special briefing team was led by Mr. Dukarani, Minister of Finance. He was accompanied by Governor Ewart Williams, as he then was. Ernst Young was there. Two lawyers from England flew down. They had a meeting in the parliament on Rison Road with the independent senators. PowerPoint, speeches, charts, tables, the whole thing. They never gave any of the independent senators a scrap of paper. Crafty. They're real crafty, yeah? So they went in the room and they turned off the lights, pow! And they started to give PowerPoint in the skin. And a few independent senators were making notes. So I have some notes, like what you might want to call fragments. Fragments. It's really serious, huh? There's real schemas up in there. And I have asked to get that briefing. As far as I'm concerned, that's a briefing by high public officials on a matter of public concern. They were trying to lobby the independent senators for their support for these two laws. And they briefed them in the parliament. And the court also granted me that. So I was successful for everything I applied for. 
That was Justice Ronnie Budu Singh. The third thing I asked for, which is coming back to you, um, Dawn, is in fact I want the names of who got money. <laughs> and I, want, I want the names and I want the date and the check number. I wasn't able to get the amount, but I didn't apply for that. I applied for the names, the date, and the details of the payment. And I was also awarded that by the court, as well as my costs, most of my costs, about 70%. And that judgment was on the 22nd of July of 2015. And immediately, on the 10th of August, 2015, Mr. Larry Hawaii, as I say in Trinidad Tobago, he ran in. I met his able assistant, Mr. Russell Martin, our senior counsel, who you would think, but anyway, he rested, <laughs> he rested there. And he was part of the team that did the high court case, and he lodged the appeal. A little while later, the PNM won the election. We all know that, 7th of September, 2015. Dr. Rowley and his team were successful. They won the national election. Mrs. Passat Bessessa and her team were now the opposition, and so on and so on. And of course, Dr. Rowley and his team had campaigned up and down this country for a long time. And they'd campaigned very well, they'd campaigned hard, and they'd campaigned about issues about corruption and accountability and transparency and good governance and all of that stuff. So they won the election on Monday, the 7th of um, September, 2015. And uh, Mr. Imbert took office on the 15th of September, 2015, which is a Tuesday. And the kind of person I am, I had a letter waiting for him when he got there that morning. <laughs> like a kind of, something he said at quarter to seven in the morning, like, <laughs> and I was pointing out to him that he had won the election and it was well done. And he had won it on accountability, transparency, and good governance. But it's now time to stop the stupidness. And you now need to give me the information. You now have the responsibility and the power as Minister of Finance. You've been duly elected. You've been duly appointed. You've been sworn in. You now have the power to write Mr. Martino and tell him, drop that case. Are you going to do it? So the first morning in the office, he had to deal with me. And what started at that stage was an extended discussion and negotiation between Mr. Imbert and myself and the Attorney General and other people like that. So we had a lot of meetings and stuff and discussions and things, and emails and arguments and things. And cutting a long story short, and I don't want anybody to be too surprised, but they didn't want to drop the case, okay? <laughs> they wanted to maintain the secrecy, and it's not what you think, it's what they're really, really doing to you. So in fact, on the 30th of December last year, which was a Friday, the last working day of the year, they actually filed, Mr. Martin and his team filed a full appeal in my case. And our case is actually set for the 24th of January of 2018, and we go on forward. So we have a situation where the, the commitment to secrecy is far greater than the commitment to the national purpose. You see? It's a real serious problem. We have a problem in which our systems to deal with wrongdoers have been disabled by the wrongdoers. So the person who was governor of the central bank at the time of the whole collapse and meltdown and so on, who was responsible, he was the head regulator, and the whole thing went down. He's now the advisor to the Minister of Finance. So Mr. Ewart Williams is now the advisor to call me, but. So when you see I'm getting pressure, it's because Ewart is still there. Okay? And that is what it is. Okay? Uh, you have a situation in which the central bank has laws that could have been activated. And these are, these are genuine laws that could have been activated to disqualify those people who did the Clico corruption from ever getting into a finance company again or ever serving in that capacity. And they wouldn't use it. They wouldn't use it. Because to do that would step on too many corns. It's really important for us as citizens to have a, a, a real sense that this is our country, OK? And if, if we lack that sense, if we, if we start to feel disembodied, or that it's not really ours, there's a danger that people could come and take away everything. Eh? And some people would say it's already happening. But you know, it's, it's, it's a danger of that, yeah? that, that that could really happen. And we have, to, we have to get rid of the idea 
that there's anything like forever. Let me talk a little fatalistically now. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to interrogate the idea that there's any, any real concept like forever. We're human beings. And it's a human society with periods of this and periods of that. And historians talk about something they call periodization when you measure off what, what different influences take place and affect the society and so on, outcomes and so on. And the reason that I'm interrogating forever is that we think that we could make this mistake and recover. And we could make that mistake and recover. And we could do this piece of stupidness and get up and dust our knees and recover. And in fact, the sorts of conflicts that develop in a society, the sorts of schisms, the sorts of opportunities for migration, and most importantly, when you juxtapose that with the sort of long-term collective solutions that we actually need to the big problems, if we lose sight of the notion that, that, that the future is a perilous thing, the future is a perilous thing, forever is not guaranteed, if we lose sight of that notion and we just relax with the idea that in fact we could give it another try and keep going, we are losing sight of an important thing because this society could fail. I don't think it's fail. It could fail. Here could be one of those places that has been. I always give this grim joke. It's not a joke. I always give this grim joke about our construction. Coming back to JCC things and construction and Patrick Manning and Cola Hart and all that stuff. And one of the big things is about, when you talk about the quality of a discussion, is the quality of the questions that you're asking. So we had a big dispute during the Cola Hart of inquiry, you decode business about the Cricket Academy, the Brian Lara Cricket Academy down at Taruba. Hafiz Karamat, there was corruption. There was corruption. I'm not saying alleged. There was corruption. Huge corruption. And the tenders and the engineering reports and the testimony and you have all of that stuff. And it's there. And it's factual. The financial situation was manipulated inside of Unicot. All of that. But you know what's interesting for me? Coming from the part of the profession I come from? that in fact the most interesting question appears never to have been asked. If you stand outside of the Brian Lara Cricket Academy, forget the construction, forget the engineering, forget Noel Garcia, forget Colahart, forget all that. So you're just standing on the pavement on the side of the highway outside of the Cricket Academy on that gentle slope that slopes downhill to the north. Do you know that if you look, you're looking north, if you look a little bit to your left, you can see another stadium right there. Now, in the advanced countries in the world that we aspire to, the Canada and the England and the America and the France and so, would they build two stadia? Even though most of their stadia are built by private sector. Would they build two stadia next to each other like that? No. I find a man answer fast, boy. <laughs> they wouldn't. <laughs> and we are, so, we are so foolhardy that not only did we build the thing, we convene a commissioner inquiry to discuss the thing. And we, we build this stupid thing. We convene a commission and we discuss this stupid thing. And we discuss the other thing. About the steel and the concrete and the contract and the check. And how we used to collect this check early. Because somebody in finance used to get a phone call from Hart to prepare a check for Karamat. And other people used to have to wait. All of that is nonsense. Why has Trinidad and Tobago got so many stayed here? For a country with 1.3 million people? We're just wasting money. It's just stupidness. You know, you're reading the papers and you laugh. You have a false sense of superiority, yeah? When you read these things and you laugh. You read any papers and you laugh about some twit, pardon my language, who win a lottery and how they waste out all the money. You know, you read those things. Well, so-and-so was a garbage collector and he won $32 million US. And six months later, he's back, you know, back by his mother. <laughs> and you laugh at it. You said he felt a real stupid boy. That's happening here. That's happening here. We are, we are that tweet. <laughs> the tweet is us, <laughs> okay? Let's, let's just be real. It's, the tweet is not somebody in a paper that you're laughing and you're getting kicks. That... It's, not, it's not that. It's us. We are, we are the tweet. So we had to get real. We had to get conscious with it. Okay? I believe, now talking about forever, and this is where forever comes into the joke, I believe that if 500 years from now there's an island 
or a landmass called Trinidad and Tobago. An archaeologist, come here. Let's talk about it. So archaeologists come here. Whatever they call that science, 500 years from now. All of us will be dead and gone. None of us will be around anymore. We'll be gone. And they, they check any place. They will, be, they will be baffled about how come we had so many stadia. Just to make one example about stadia. How come? And let me tell you something. The best brains in the world won't be able to make sense of it. Up to now, the best brains in the world can make sense of it. It cannot come like the Easter Island heads. When you read about the Easter Island heads, and they, they used to have a, they had a form of worship, and they were doing something. And it, 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 when you're reading it at one level, it gets kind of mystical, and you say, well, the, all the heads are looking to the west, and what did it mean? And you, you're going into a deep thing, eh? To a higher dial, and you're going down in it, eh? But when you really stop and think, you say, well, what was all that about? Because they must have taken every man on the island, every strong person on the island must have been just making heads. For what? So there has to be a, and this is not to, this is not to cast humor on anybody's beliefs. It probably was our temples. Yeah. But no. But it's a serious thing. What, what is it we're really doing? So I want to, There are a lot of different things I want to say. I want to pause. <laughs> I want to pause. Um, I'm not sure how long I've been going, but I can pause here and take another sip of my drink and take some questions, and we could have a little exchange.